Good morning. How's everyone doing? Come on. Let's do a little better than that. How's everyone doing? All right. Welcome to the Domain Fest keynote address. Uh, I've been looking forward to this all week long. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of audience participation. I want to see a show of hands. How many people here have a Twitter account? That's staggering. Look at that. I mean, it's almost 90%. That's amazing. How many people have made a tweet in 2012? Active users, OK. How many people have made a tweet this week? OK, now, the most important question. How many people follow Kim Kardashian on Twitter? <laughs> you guys are all lying. I know it. I know it. So I'm here to uh, introduce uh, our keynoter, Biz Stone. And uh, he obviously is the co-founder of Twitter. Um, we're going to talk about four things. Um, obviously, we want to hear the Twitter story. How did it form? Uh, what was the idea behind that? Uh, some of the key challenges that he was able to overcome. Uh, it's really a fascinating story. And in five years, he's built one of the greatest companies uh, online of all time. Um, but generally speaking, he's also going to give us insight into how to build a great company and the importance of culture in business success. Um, we're also going to talk about something that's very important to biz, and that's social responsibility. And then lastly, being a pioneer of the web and certainly being a very successful business person within it, he'll give us his thoughts on the future of social media. Now, let me give you a few of biz's accomplishments. And uh, it's pretty humbling when you look at the accolades that this uh, person in such a few number of years has been able to uh, accomplish. He was named by GQ Magazine as Nerd of the Year. There you go. Yeah. He was named by Vanity Fair one of the top 10 most influential people of the information age. Now, I have to say I find this a little amusing. Not to be outdone, Time Magazine said he's one of the most influential people in the world. So he was able to uh, jump beyond just the information age. And lastly, uh, Inc. Magazine declared him Entrepreneur of the Decade. Now, a little bit of overview for Biz. Um, his uh, uh, career on the internet started in the late 90s. He was one of the early pioneers in social media. Uh, he actually did uh, a brief stint at Google. And uh, he'll tell us a little bit about that experience. But he co-founded and launched Twitter in 2006. And in five years, it's staggering what's been accomplished. One in 10 online users is registered on Twitter. Over 100 million registered users on the Twitter platform. They raised around their Series G funding in the fall of uh, last year, and they were able to raise that at a valuation of $8 billion. And it's reported that the valuation is now approaching $12 billion. It's even said that the Pope himself has a Twitter account. So uh, we know that we've uh, done something when the Pope is now on your platform. Um, he also co-founded the Obvious Corporation, which we'll spend some time talking about. And that's a very important cause for him that gets to his social responsibility and highlights, really, that he is becoming a, a true humanitarian. But there's more. He's published countless articles and two books. Uh, he's a visiting scholar and lecturer world worldwide. Uh, he's actually even a fellow at Oxford. And he recently debated and won at Oxford Union. And I know he goes back there each year. Uh, but I know in talking to Biz, uh, he's a very down-to-earth person. And the one accomplishment I know that he would say is he's most proud of is the re recent birth of his son, Jacob. So without further ado, please give a warm Domain Fest welcome to Biz Stone. When you put it all together like that, I sound pretty fancy. Yes, yeah, I'm <laughs> humbling. Can you do that for my wife? <laughs> like, when I come home? So, Biz, before, <laughs> before we kind of jump into you know, the Twitter and the obvious business questions, let's, let's start where it all began, your childhood. Uh, you grew up in Wellesley, Massachusetts. And maybe tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up there, some of your childhood experiences. It's like a therapy. It, well, it is. Session. We like, have a couch in the back. You can lay on the floor if you'd like. It'd be easier. There's nobody here. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what are we doing? We're talking about my childhood? OK. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, well, actually, 
Yeah, I mean, I was super lucky because we, my mom was adopted um, by this nice Swedish couple, and they they lived in this affluent town west of Boston, like 12 miles west of Boston, called Wellesley, where Wellesley College is. Um, and uh, we didn't have any money, but we got to live in this really fancy town, and so we get, that meant we got, got to go to these really great schools, which, I mean, at the time, I'm, you know, just like any other kid, I'm complaining about school, but it turns out that the school system is, you know, was awesome. It, could, it might as well have been like a really high-end private school or something. Um, so I didn't even realize, I didn't even realize how lucky I was until later, um, because the school let me just do so many cool things, which I think, um, which I think really manifested later, didn't, you know, years and years later, I realize now that um, they were helping me become an entrepreneur and become someone who basically uh, had the confidence to um, feel like I was able to do anything that I wanted. So, so one example is just from the town, or like really early on, um, my mom enrolled me in this program called uh, Boy Rangers. Not Boy Scouts, Boy Rangers. Okay. It was this weird sort of, it was dying off, and it was like the inspiration for Boy Scouts, but it was like made a long time ago, and it was a little like awkward and maybe slightly like in, inappropriate, where we, where we dressed up like American Indians, <laughs> and we had to advance from papoose to warrior by like learning how to tie knots and do all these things and stuff. And it was a little awkward because it was father son and my my father was gone, so I just it was just me. And uh, and I was like, okay. And I had to do that every Saturday. And my name, the name that they gave me was Owl Bear because I was smart like an owl and strong like a bear. And what, um, what was it again? Owl Bear. Owl Owl Bear. Owl Bear. Like, okay. Smart like an owl. Strong like a bear, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and I became chief of my tribe. Anyways, <laughs> the the point is um, the uh, I because I was in this weird program, I never went into sports, and so when I got to high school, I thought, oh, getting in, getting being on a sports team seems like a really good way of being part of the community in the high school, and. Um, uh, so I decided I would try out for some some of the sports teams, and but all the other kids had been doing like pee wee, you know, soccer and little little league baseball and all these other things. So I go to like try out for football or basketball or whatever, and I was just I had no idea what the rules were, <laughs> what anything was, and uh, so I was in, I was just too intimidated. I was fairly naturally athletic. Yeah. But I, I held back. So what coach, you know, was going to want me? I didn't really do anything. So what I did was, and this I think comes again from the support of the school, the way they operated was I, I did a little research and I found out what sport does the school not ha um, support, and the one of the, the they didn't support. They didn't have a lacrosse program. So I asked the administration if I were to find a coach and enough boys to be on a lacrosse team, could I? could we have a lacrosse program? And they were like, yeah, if you can do that, fine. And, but, I was, but I was able to do that. And so we start, and the, the reason behind that was, my thinking was that if everyone was as clueless as I was about lacrosse, then it was like a level playing field. I didn't have to be intimidated, because none of us knew anything. <laughs> Um, and so that was great because it turned out I was really, it's funny how I just didn't learn the rules of soccer. I just, just decided to do this whole other harder thing. But, um, but it was great because I ended up becoming captain of the lacrosse team. I was really good at it. I was like the top scoring guy. And, and it was just this amazing experience to be able to kind of be a founder of the, of the men's lacrosse team at Wellesley, which is now they have a women's and a men's and it's a whole big thing that they have there at the, at the high school. And I realized, like much later in life, that um, the lesson I took away from that is that um, opportunity can be manufactured. You know, like people often think about opportunity as something that you wait until it comes along. It's defined as a set of circumstances that um, come together at just the right moment for you to sort of seize. Everyone talks about seizing opportunity, but never, no one ever talks about actually manufacturing those collection of 
uh, uh, things that you could you put them together and then just take them. And so I kind of manufactured my own opportunity there. And that, even though that's like a childhood thing that comes with boy rangers and all that other stuff, it actually works for, um, it works well for just management and startups and everything else too. Uh, the, just the idea that the aphorism that opportunity can be manufactured. So um, that's one childhood thing. And is there an owl bear statue now in Leslie? Is that a no? There, there isn't. But I actually um, made a fake company called Owl Bear Industries Inc. and had a logo made for me. <laughs> I've had a lot of fake companies. I used to have. <laughs> I, I had. I had. Uh, I when I was. When I was just by myself, like consult, doing like consulting work um, between dropping out of college and learning how to become a designer, I I pretended I had a company called Genius Labs, and it was really just so I could write on my blog and say, you know, here at Genius Labs, we're currently working on a way to see through our laptop screens and watch TV, um, and like. The, the funny thing was that when I went to work at Google, I wrote a fake press release on my blog saying, Google acquires Genius Labs. <laughs> and somehow that, like, that got into Wikipedia as a real thing. And <laughs> oh now if you, any, every magazine that ever lists the, the, the things, the companies that Google acquired, I'm in there. It's, it's, it's like, it's like um, Deja News, Blogger, Genius Labs, <laughs> da 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 da. It's like a real thing now. It's like yeah, I'm not sure I need to ask this, but what kind of kid were you? I mean, were you always getting into trouble? Or were you always pushing the fold? Were you shy? Um, were you? I was yeah. Well, I mean, like later on in high school, I was I got into trouble a lot, but it was like good trouble. I had I had really good relationships with my teachers. Uh -huh. You know, like um, for example, there like I never went to school dances. I was, I was like. Too shy. To, uh, that wasn't my thing. All my friends were dorks and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was weird because I was captain of the lacrosse team, so I was like a jock. But I didn't like to hang out with those guys. I hung out with all my like math elite friends, you know. And um, and so we never really went to like dances or anything. And then at the end, at the end of high school, it was the last dance ever or whatever. And I was up, I was up in my friend's attic reading comic books. And um, I said, you know, we should go to the <laughs> the thing, the dance, because we, it's the last one, and we, yeah. we're dorks, and we never went. We should at least be able to say we went to one. And um, he was like, no, I'm, I don't want to. And I said, come on, let's just do it. Let's just go, and, and like, you know, we'll, we'll try to have fun, and we'll be able to remember it forever. And, and we went, and there was a rule that you couldn't go in past 9.30 or 10.30 or something like that. Yeah. And, and so I said, we better hurry. So. Um, we like rode our bikes really fast there, or whatever, and uh, we. It was too late, and the 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 principal was out front saying, "Sorry, guys, you can't come in. There's a rule." And um, I said, "Okay, we understand the rules." And we um, we left, and my friend was like, "You're giving up that easy? Like usually, usually you you know think of something." And I said, "No, no, no. I t I have a whole plan. Don't worry about it." And. Uh, <laughs> And he was like, what's the plan? I was like, let's just get out of it. So I said, I said, the dance is in the cafeteria. All we have to do is walk around on the other side. And the, it's hot and they are with all the people in there. They're going to have the windows open. And we'll just climb through the windows and we'll just be in. And no one will know because there's lots of people. So he was like, oh, OK. So we went around. We climbed through the windows. And almost as soon as we were in there, the principal was like, he bumped into us. Like, just <laughs> ran. And, and he was like, I thought I, how, what, I thought I told you guys that you couldn't come in. And we we're like, yeah, you did. We came through the window. And he said, you guys are in big trouble. Follow me upstairs. And um, so we started following upstairs. And then I realized, like, you know what? That's not the plan. The plan was to go to this dance. So as we were falling up the stairs, I just turned around. My friend was behind me. I turned around. And I said, I'm, I'm going back down. I'm going. And I just started going back downstairs. And, and my friend was like, what do I do? What do we do? And uh, he was sure, if, if, should I follow him or should he follow the? Yeah. And then he just followed me. And the teacher was like, you come back here. You, you, you. And then I ran downstairs and I immediately asked my friend Mark Innsberg, like, don't ask me questions. Switch t-shirts with me right now. <laughs> and because he had the like, same kind of build and hair as me. Yeah. And so like, we immediately switched t-shirts. And um, the principal ran down and spun Mark around, like, whoa, sorry, wrong guy. 
And so we got away with being at the dance, but obviously we were in big trouble, so we got um, suspended from school. But we got suspended in-house, and we were asked to write an essay about what we did wrong. And I decided I would, I loved writing essays, so I decided I would write a really good essay about like why this was the right decision and how it was linked to like, um, you know, citizen, uh, what do you call it? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyways. I don't know where you're going. <laughs> anyways, I, I wrote this really great essay and then they had, uh, they had us meet with like the, after writing the essay, they had us meet with the school psychologist to like, <laughs> and she, after I shut the door, she said, I have to say, this is a wonderful essay and I totally agree with you. Um, <laughs> Oh, it's civil disobedience, that's what it was. Oh, okay. All right. I linked it to civil disobedience in this grand way. And she just basically told me, I agree with you, you were totally right. Yeah. And I was like, I know. So I did get in trouble, but you know, like I mean, yeah. it was good trouble. And then when I was a little kid, my, mom, the, my mom's adopted father worked for the telephone company. And he, in the basement, he, had, he, had, he died before I met him, but he had left behind this huge, like almost like an apothecary chest of gears and wires and all kinds of thingamajiggies that you use to put together telephones. And I used to tell my mom when I was like four, I'm going downstairs to invent things. And I would just go down there for hours and like randomly connect things and be like, all right, that was good. Got some good work done. And um, she had a friend whose husband was an, uh, was an electrician. And I just thought this was amazing because he had in his basement what I considered to be a lab. And uh, I would go over there and be like, I have an idea. We're going to build, now stand back because this is revolutionary, a way for me to breathe underwater using two old Pepsi bottles and some tubes. And he was like, you mean scuba? And I was like, that's a bad name, but um, <laughs> we'll figure out the name later. The point is I'll be able to breathe underwater. And he was like, well, we'll need an air compressor and all that. And I was like, so? So get it in your lab. Come on. Let's <laughs> and he determined that it, that wasn't a safe thing for me to build, so we built something else. But it was, anyways, it was fun. I was encouraged. So let, let's talk a little bit about some of your early job experiences. I don't, did you have odd jobs in high school and kind of oh, yeah. coming into your 20s? What were the kinds of things that were attractive to you and, and, and kind of I always worked. Your interest? I always worked. Like, even... Um, when I was 10, I went around the neighborhood I pushing it around with my, pushing my lawnmower around and just knocking on doors and saying, I mow lawns, and here's my lawnmower, so what do you think? And, um, and some of my clients were really far away, and I like, pushed the lawnmower down the sidewalk for uh, like a mile. Um, but it was good money, and especially if I like, ran with the lawnmower. I was like, I can make 20 bucks in half an hour if I just go really fast. Um, and uh, so I always worked, and then I worked at the grocery store, and um, it was funny because I always worked, but I didn't think about money, and, and I had to help the family with money, and my mom would always be like, where's your paycheck? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I just, thought it was, I just thought it was part of my life that I had to go to school, and then I had to go to work, and then I, I had to go to school, then I had to go to lacrosse practice, and then I had to go to work, and then I could go home. And, and I had a, I made my own, uh, like, uh, rule or like, uh, what do you call it, like a philosophy. I had my own philosophy that I don't do homework. Because um, I tried to do homework on the first day of high school and it took me like till three in the morning to do all the assigned homework. So I told my teachers, I said, it's, it's just too much. Like I can't do everything. So um, I'm not gonna do my homework. Um, that's just my personal philosophy. Um, and, but I will pay attention in class. And they were like, okay, but you're going to get a worse grade if you don't do any of your homework. And I was like, I know, it's fine. And I, I remember distinctly my friend Matt Flanagan was always ang had all this anxiety and all these books in his book pack, ba uh, backpack. And at the end of the day, I would just shut my locker and go home with nothing. And he was like, what are you doing? And I was like, personal philosophy, no homework. <laughs> and he was like, you can't do that. I was like, I can do whatever I want, personal <laughs> philosophy. But uh, anyways, so... <laughs> So I did well in high school, and then um, I, didn't, I didn't know you didn't have to go to college. For some reason, I just, you know, they were, it was just you have to go to college. And I, right. It's silly. I didn't, I, I, sh I should, I was the perfect candidate to, like, not go right away. Should have done something else for a while. 
But I, um, in fact, I was kind of a jerk about the whole thing because I was sitting in the guidance counselor's office being kind of like, you know, a punk. And she was like, you, you know, there's a week left to, to, you know, figure out what college you want to go to and write the essays and do all this stuff. And I, I looked over at this girl whose name was Jess Clayson, and I said, Jess, what college are you going to? And she said, Northeastern. I said, I really want to go to Northeastern. It's my, heart, my, my heart is set on it, <laughs> like a total punk. And uh, so I went to Northeastern. I got into Northeastern on scholarship, and um, I didn't like it um, because I thought I could do anything I wanted like I was in high school. And they were like, no. <laughs> like, one time I just took a week off, and they were like, you can't do that. <laughs> I was like, what, personal philosophy, week off. <laughs> and they're like, it's not how it works. And so I didn't go back for the next year. And then I went, and then I got this like, invitation to go to UMass, and they would pay me to go to school. And I was like, OK, well, that's pretty good. Um, and I went there on a, like an arts chancellor scholarship for the excellence in the arts. Um, but I didn't like that either. And so what happened was I got a side job while I was at UMass. Um, moving boxes from the attic to the lobby of a publishing company called Little Brown and Company in Boston on Beacon Hill. And I was always an artist in, um, in high school. That was one of the, my favorite things was art. And, uh, and this was at a time, the time I got this job was at a time when they were just switching over from old school techniques in the art department for creating book covers from like stat machines and and um, exacto knives and um, you know sort of cut and pasting things together to Macs. And I had uh, my my friend had had a Mac um, in his house like early, one of the early ones. And then my school had had some Macs that I spent a lot of time on. And I had become uh, savvy. And um, one day when that art department was out to lunch, everyone was gone. I snuck on to the. I snuck into the art director's office. I found a transmittal for a book cover that hadn't been designed yet. This is the, the transmittal is the piece of paper that says the title, the subtitle, what the editors and sales want the cover to convey. And I, um, I designed a book cover and I printed it out and I matted it up and I slipped it in with the others to go off for approval and editorial and sales in New York. And then I went about moving the boxes again. And then when the, when the art director came back, um, a few days later, he said, who designed this cover? Because it got chosen. And I said, me. And he said, the box guy. And, uh, <laughs> and that, ended up, that ended up becoming a huge thing for me, because he offered me a job as a designer, and not just as a designer, but working directly with him to help him learn the computer and, and, and also design book jackets. It became, what, in my mind, what that became was an apprenticeship. Mm. And, um, that was an amazing thing for me. I mean, the, of course, the first day, as my, the first official day as a designer at Little Brown, I went in, and he, uh, the art director called me into his office, and he didn't say anything. He just reached behind him, and he tore off a, he, he took a book of Pantone color swatches. He flipped to like a section of these like sort of browns and chocolatey and sort of mocha colors, and he. He tore one out all the while, not saying anything, put it on his desk, slid it across with one finger, and said, that's how I take my coffee. Wow. And I thought to myself, oh my god, I dropped out of college, and this, this, this is what I'm going to do now. And he was like, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh my god. And actually, it would have, but it would have been a good test uh, yeah. to see if I could have matched that color at Dunkin' Donuts, like with the lady. <laughs> like, no, 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 more cream, no, less cream. You know, would, I, should, it would have been a good test. Um, he should have made me do it, but um, yeah. <laughs> anyways, the point is, what that was, was, it ended up being two to three years of, of this wonderful apprenticeship where I learned, um, I learned graphic design, and I learned how to design covers, and I was really good at it, and I won some awards, but the most important thing I got out of that, and out of that relationship with this um, very knowledgeable uh, creative director named St Steve Snyder, was a, a, another aphorism, and because uh, there was no one book cover that was the right book cover, there was, there was infinite. Um, if the sales and editorial didn't like it, you could always do another one. So what I took away from that is that 
creativity is a renewable resource. It's something that you can always um, tap. You never run out of it. And, and that's something that I remembered, uh, you know, that I've always kept with me is just come at, come at challenges from a creative point of view and it's, it, it won't be, it, it, it'll be fun and you will have unlimited resources. Well, let's, let's take that as a great segue into Twitter because clearly um, you're sitting up here to a great extent because of it. Uh, and I'd like Not to because of my book cover oh. awards. Perhaps that Best too. of New England. <laughs> um, let's talk about the idea for Twitter. Where did that come from? Um, the name Twitter, I know that you also purchased the domain. It, I, right. I hear you have a pretty good story around that, and obviously this is a domain conference, so yeah. uh, it'd be good to hear that. So the story of Twitter is long and twisty, So I, I, and I'm talking too much, so I'll... Um, <laughs> I'll try to figure out where to start it. Uh, we, I, I, I was going to say dropped out because Google so much like school, but I left Google um, to continue working with Evan Williams, uh, who I worked with at Blogger, and I really admired and loved working with. And he had left, so I left and followed him. And we worked on this project together that we had, we had dreamed up uh, called Odeo. We, it was based on a question I asked, which was, can we iPods had just come out and were starting to be a thing, and and I said, could you record your voice in Flash on the browser, and then convert it to an MP3, and then could you, when you plug your iPod in, could we write a little bit of software that syncs what you recorded to your iPod, and therefore we could democratize audio like we did for text on blogging? And he was like, oh my God, that's a whole thing, and we were like, that's a whole thing. We just invented a new thing. <laughs> and it turns out that other people had been thinking of it and calling it podcasting. And, um, and, uh, but it was brand new. So we, yeah. we decided to get into it. And the problem with the pro what happened was we, we raised too much money too early because um, people were like, sure, it's you guys. Here's a lot of money. Go make a podcasting thing. And then we, a lot of stuff happened, like Apple decided to put podcasting in iTunes, and we were like, oh, that's probably a better place to put it. Um, and, but the, the bigger problem was that we actually didn't, didn't do podcasting. We, we kind of clammed up when we turned on the microphone, and we realized that good audio is, is actually, good audio is highly produced. It's better to listen to NPR than to some guy in his basement for an hour talking about RSS. <laughs> uh, so, so we were, that, that's, that was the, the big problem was we didn't use our own product. That's a huge thing. And so what Ev did, which was really smart, was he said, look, guys, let's all, there's about 12 of us. Everybody pair up and just spend two weeks working on something that you would like to see in the world. And we'll all, we'll all jam, and then we'll all, um, we'll, all take, we'll all share each other's projects after two weeks. So I paired up with a guy named Jack Dorsey, who we'd hired as an engineer. And, who I had formed a great relationship with. We had, we had been like working on audio, but like also dabbling on a lot of little side projects because we enjoyed collaborating. And uh, we, we, we had both, it turns out we had both been kind of noodling around this thing for a while. I had, in 2003, I had tried to create something I called Side Blogger, which was um, for those crappy posts that you don't think are good enough for your blog. Uh, you can, you can write them on the side of your blog. Like, and it was just like short sentence blogging that you didn't feel was good enough. Because um, I found that, I thought that most of my blog posts were crappy. And so and that didn't take off. Um, but, and Jack, it turns out, had been working on like noodling with this idea of like status messages for, for people um, instead of status messages for like police cars or ambulances. Like I'm here at, you know. So we, got, we came together, and this was at a time when SMS was beginning to, or texting was beginning to be a thing in the US. It was already really popular in Europe, but in around 2005, 2006, all the carriers decided that you could send texts to each carrier before it was siloed. And we said, I wonder if we could build a whole thing, like a, like a network, um, a way to communicate, um, or a way to broadcast, 
over this network, this, SM, this existing SMS network that really isn't being taken advantage of. So the initial idea was, let's create a way for people to broadcast their, their current status over SMS. Uh, somewhat like the, um, the mood uh, or the status thing on AIM that, that was around then, which was, you know, I'm grumpy or I'm out of the office or whatever, and, and you could get at a glance sort of get this ambient idea of what all your friends were feeling. And so that's what we, that was our initial project for two weeks. And um, it was a lot of just faked um, workflows uh, that I designed, and then, um, and then a very rudimentary hookup uh, from uh, text messaging to the web. And, uh, and so that's how Twitter got, Twitter got started, and we wanted to name it Twitter because it was, just a, it was just me and Jack and a few other people, and it wasn't a big team, so we didn't have to go through this whole like naming process, which is usually really hard. We just we knew we wanted something that had this sense of immediacy and the, the sense of uh, like your phone buzzing in your pocket, and and so we had we had words like jitter and um, and uh, in there, and like like and that sounded to me like too like sort of caffeine addled, you know like. Like it sounded negative, and so, and someone had looked through the dictionary, and just um, Noah Glass was one of the guys who were who was at Odeo, who had, was helping us name it, and he was going through the dictionary and found Twitter, and he didn't even know what it meant. He just thought it sounded like that, that urgency, and I knew my wife is a wild care, uh, is a wildlife rehabilitation specialist, and so our um, we're all about the animals and stuff in our house, and I knew that Twitter meant the short bursts of information that birds. Um, use uh, to communicate. And it all, its secondary definition was laughter. And I said, oh my god, this is such a perfect name. We have to use it. And the guys were like, really? And I was just so into it that they were like, all right, settle down. We'll use Twitter. And uh, like you said, the domain name was taken. And um, so we, uh, and we didn't have any money. So we didn't want to like buy it. So we just did TWTTR at first. Uh, and. Um, what happened later was it started to become a thing, and, and not that much of a thing, luckily, that we, the Twitter was owned by a bird enthusiast, and he just had some like pictures of some birds up there, twitter.com, and we offered him, I think, like 7,500 or something like that, and he was like, holy crap, payday. <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, and, you know, in our defense, we had no idea that it was gonna be a whole big thing, like, at the bottom of the website, it just said, having problems, call biz, and it had my cell phone number. And, um, and that was on there for a really long time and became a, a nuisance for me later. But, um, <laughs> and and 7,500 bucks was kind of a lot of money for us. You, and you know? designed the logo, right? I mean, you personally? Yeah, I did. I drew the bird, and not the, wor the, the typeface, the, the, the rounded typeface was, uh, was a designer named Am Amy Franchini. That was her work, um, um, but I drew a little birdie, and um, because even from the beginning, I did, I wanted something that you know represented nature, represented the idea that uh, it's not about technology; it's about humanity, it's about the natural world. Because Google, Google's overwhelming mantra was basically, "We can achieve anything with technology," and it was all about tech. And I have some funny stories from Google if you want to hear them. But um, uh, my, I sort of switched that around and said, it, you know, it's all about um, humanity with a little help from tech. So let's re let's reference nature. And so I wanted, I said, any company can have like a little, have a the first letter of their name be their logo, but only one company can have a bird in flight representing. Uh, you know, the freedom of expression and speech that Twitter um, uh, supports. So uh, we went with, we started going with, uh, like a few years ago, I, I told everyone, we're, the bird is our logo, use the bird everywhere, like the Nike swoosh. So it's still in transition because people like to use the T, but I, I, it kills me every time I see a little T because I want to see the bird. What were some of the early naysayers um, about the business model and or the product and service, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that there would have yeah. been a few of those along the way. Oh, it was, well, the main thing was, like, for the first two or three years, everyone just said Twitter 
you know, it was like kind of a joke, you know? I mean, uh, one, one comment was Twitter is the Seinfeld of the internet. It's, it's a website about nothing. And I actually, because I actually thought that was a compliment because I love Seinfeld. You know? <laughs> um, so I put, you, I put that on the front page as a testimonial. Did you question it at all? I mean, um, was, it, was there a point where you're like, okay. No, because he, here's what happened. Everyone said Twitter's not useful. That was, yeah. a, that was the main thing. Twitter's yeah. not useful. Uh, and Evan at the time said, well, neither is ice cream. You're like, should we ban ice cream and all joy? <laughs> like, um, we, we had been using it, and we, the point was we were using it and loving yeah. it. And even and that, and for, that alone was a huge thing for us, because we were, we were actively engaged in our own product that we had invited some friends to, and we were using, and, and maybe there was only a few hundred people on it, but it was, it was, there were signs that it was going to be awesome. Like, I was on BART, and uh, I heard people muttering about some earthquake, and we were about to go under the bay, and I was like, wait a minute, I, I, should I get <laughs> yeah. off this thing? And then my phone buzzed in my pocket like three or four times, and there was a bunch of my Twitter friends saying, oh, it was a nothing, it was a 4.2 on the, on the Hayward fault, and it's no big deal and everything, and I was like, oh, okay, I'll just stay on here. And I was like, wow, that, that's, that was cool. That was immediate information that made me make a real life decision. Um, another thing that happened was very early on when we were prototyping, I, uh, my wife and I had just bought this tiny little house in Berkeley and I decided to do some home maintenance, which I'm not good at, but since I watched Bob Vila as a kid, thought I could do it. Um, and I decided to rip up all the carpeting in this little 700 square foot house we bought. And I was sweating and it was, if you've ever, if you don't rip up carpet if you ever, if you ever have this idea, because they nail it down all along the edge, like every one centimeter. It's ridiculous. And uh, sweating, I'm ripping it up, I'm finding all kinds of stuff underneath the carpet I don't want to remember. Um, and my phone buzzed in my pocket, and it was Ev, and it was a tweet, and it was um, sipping Pinot Noir after a massage in Napa Valley. And I just laughed out loud at the incongruence <laughs> of the two things. And, and what that made me think was like, I'm laughing. I'm laughing at a product we're working on. This is perfect. This is just how it's supposed to be. So that just distanced me completely from everyone who said it's not useless. It's not useful. And um, and so so for a long time, for like the first year, and until until something happened that would have that will change would have changed our minds. That was enough to keep us going. Um, and and as an artist, th that sort of like emotional resonance with me was what kept me uh, keyed into it and kept that was enough for me to keep going. So let, let's talk about a story that I still am amazed by. I know early in the growth and it was growing but early in the growth of Twitter apparently you were offered a check by Mark Zuckerberg for 500 million dollars and that was just after the company had been valued at 20 million dollars. Yes yeah, something around 20 yeah. How do, you, how do you do that? What's wrong with you? Like, how, what, what, um, <laughs> what, I know, it's weird because it's a ton of money and it, like, you know, we were on government cheese and food stamps when I was a kid, so yeah, yeah. it's like a weird abstract thing. It's like, it's not real. Um, but, the, so I'll just tell you the whole story and, and I should also tell you my three theories on when you should sell your company, but I'll tell those after the. So the whole story is basically, yeah, you're right. The company had been valued at, like, we're skipping ahead now after we realized Twitter was going to be a thing and we incorporated and, and it was growing and big things were happening and we knew we were going to, we knew it was worthwhile and we knew we were going to have a, a, a good company on our hands. and. Um, I was living in Ber still living in Berkeley at the time, and I had to walk to the BART, which was half an hour. I had to take a half hour ride in the BART. I'd walk half hour to work, my computer, my backpack, and all that stuff. So I'm like schwitzing by the time I get to the office. And one of my colleagues says, go downstairs. Ev's waiting for you in his car. And I said, why? And he said, he'll tell you. I go downstairs. Ev's in the car. I get in. I said, where are we going? And he said, we're going to Palo Alto. And I said, why are we going to Palo Alto? And he said, we're going to see Mark Zuckerberg. And I said, why are we going to see Mark Zuckerberg? He said, because they want to. Uh, partner with us. And I said, what do you mean by partner? He said, acquire. Uh, there's all these like, everything's like high, everything's like middle school in Silicon Valley. Like, do you like me? Because if you like me, I like you. Do you like me like me? And, uh, and it's always couched in these terms, you know? And so, 
He said, yeah, they want to, yeah, they want to buy us. And, and so I was like, really? For how much? And this is the whole time we're driving. And he was like, I don't know. What, what's, I don't know. What do you think's what? And so I just came up with a number that I thought was like laughably absurd that would get us out of it. Like, um, because we wanted to, we, like, like I said, we knew we were going to be a business and we hadn't even, we hadn't even launched any business model stuff yet. So I was like, how about 500 million? And we were like, oh my God, we're laughing. Like, that's so ridiculous. Like, it's so stupid. Like, he's, got, he's gonna, obviously he'll kick us out when we say it. And, so we were laugh. We had a good laugh on the way down there, and then we went into the office, and Mark and we got name tags, and um, we brought up to Mark, and he was like, "Welcome to Facebook," and we said, "Thank you," and he said, "Do you want a tour?" And at that time, Facebook was just downtown Silicon Valley, so we ended up just walking around downtown Silicon Valley. I mean, down not Silicon Valley, Palo Alto. We just ended up walking down Palo Alto with name tags on, um, <laughs> and it was really awkward for us, and. Uh, and Mark was like, you know, you didn't need to put the name tags on. And we were like, well, the lady said we did. And <laughs> so we had him on. And then he, showed, he was like, do you want to see our buildings? And, we're, and we said, OK. And it was just the building with people in it working on computers and stuff. And we were like, oh, that's cool. And then he, he's like, you want to see another building? And we're like, OK. <laughs> so we saw another building with people and working on computers. And, uh, and then he said, OK, let's go into this room here. And it was this really tiny room with a love seat and a chair. And Mark went in first and just took the chair and leaving the love seat for Evan and I. And I went in first and I said, well, I guess I'll sit on the love seat. And, and then Evan followed me and he said, should I close the door or leave it open? And Mark said, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and Evan was like, what does that mean? Yeah, like, uh, uh, so, and so Ev just said, OK, well, I'll just close it this much. And he like, sort of left it like two inches open, because he wasn't sure. It was kind of a middle of the road thing. And then, uh, and then he squished next to me in a love seat. And I was like making all these jokes, and they were just <laughs> Dying like I was not a good crowd, and um, I think I still to this day think Stanford should have like comedy 101 because <laughs> a lot of those guys at Stanford are like, they, yeah, they don't get jokes. Anyways, they're smart. Um, but so then it came to this moment where like again it's like middle school where where Mark said, well you know I don't like to talk about numbers, and I and I usually don't and. And Ev said, well, we don't, we don't like to talk about numbers either. <laughs> and, uh, and Mark said, but if you, know, if you were to say a number, uh, I could say yes or no right now. And Ev looked at me and he said, 500 million? And Mark said, that's a lot of money. And I said, you said you'd say yes or no. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And he, uh, and he, again, he just looked at the ground or something. And, and, then, um, and then Mark said, do you want to see our cafeteria? And we're like, OK. <laughs> so as we were waiting in line at the cafeteria, it was just a really long line. And I just anticipated waiting in a long line. And then what was the lunch conversation going to be like? And I said, um, I don't wear a watch, but I said, oh, Ev, you know what? We got, we got to go. We got, that, we got a thing. <laughs> and Ev was like, oh, right. Yeah, oh, Mark, we can't have lunch with you. We, gotta, we have to go. We have a thing. And Mark was like, oh, that's too bad. And we were like, yeah, that's, but we'll, we'll email you. And um, so that's how we got out of there. And then, um, and so that was all funny and all that stuff. But it, truth be told, you know, the reason we, and we wrote a really, really respectful email after that. I mean, I didn't want to make it seem like we just like, jo you know, uh, joked them off. We wrote this in really respectful email saying that we truly admired their work and that, and that we basically felt like we were doing the same sort of work for humanity and they were amazing. But, um, and, and, they were, and, and oh, I forgot to tell you, they came up with the money. Like they, 
they actually came up with a mix of cash and stock that, and we were just like, oh my God, we didn't, th this was, we didn't think you would do this. So we, we wrote a really nice email saying um, wh exactly why we weren't ready because we really felt like we had something here. We wanted to see it through. We wanted to make a business out of it, et cetera, et cetera. And we wrote that, and we explained to our board why that was true, and we explained to Mark why that was true in a very honest, open, and respectful way. And, and he, and Mark, as a fellow entrepreneur, just totally got it, and he understood. So it, all, it worked out great um, all around. Um, and so that's basically how that went down. And then we just, you know, w we were just really geared up, and, and um, we tried to make that uh, um, the least possible distraction it could possibly be. And we minimized it, and we told our team, you know, Facebook approaches with this, but we're not going to do it because of these reasons. And yeah. Here we go. Let's keep working. And, it was a um, good decision. I mean, yeah, and it turned. And it, you know, uh, Ev, a, Ev, Ev said this crazy guy. thing to me, which I thought he was just. I thought he had like lost his mind. He said, "If we're worth five hundred million, then we're worth a billion. And if we're worth a billion, we're worth ten billion. And I was like, "What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what sort of math is that? I, like." <laughs> And um, he was right. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, Ev has often described himself as a hallucinogenic optimist. <laughs> and I think that's where that math came from. Yeah. Um, but I, I just put my trust in him and said, OK. So yeah, it, it turned out to be great. And Twitter um, you know, just has become one of the like, big, successful internet companies. Yeah. And how is your life different? I mean, I always wonder, you know, you've, you've reached this pinnacle of success, $10 billion company, uh, you've got all these awards and accolades. How, how exactly is your life different? Does it feel different? Um, well, my life's different for, like, a lot of reasons. But, um, well, for one thing, like, you guys invited me to come here, and, <laughs> and like, and you're listening to me. So that's, like, other, I, I don't know if that would happen. Um, uh, the other thing is, um, I mean, just like, frankly, I like, I can, um, I can, like, people will answer my phone calls and stuff, um, <laughs> which is awesome. It's especially good when I'm helping other startups and stuff, you know? And, um, all, the other thing is I'm just, I'm in a position now to be able to do extra good stuff, um, for the world and, um, and to be able to, uh, to be able to do more philanthropy. My wife and I had a, had, have long been involved in philanthropy under the philosophy that um, there's a compound interest in altruism, and the earlier you get started helping people, the more impact you'll have over time, rather than waiting until you think you have enough to, to give. You can volunteer, you can, you, can, what, you can help raise awareness, et cetera, and you do that over time, and it grows like just like a, a compound interest bank account would grow. Um, and, but now I'm, a, now I'm in a position to be a lot more helpful in, in those types of capacities. Uh, and um, yeah, it's also changed in that people like my friends back home read like Twitter valued at you know, X billion and they think that's how much I have in my like, checking account. Right. You know, even though the Twitter, uh, the company is not IPO'd, I don't own the whole company. Yeah. Uh, they're like, so, um, you know, I only need $4 million. Would it be cool if you gave that to me? Because I just, I, <laughs> yeah. I read that you had $10 billion, And it's awkward conversation. Has it been disappointing? Have you had some of those disappointing encounters where people just assumed or you felt took advantage of the fact that, you know, at least on paper, you're... No, I mean, person? I just explained to them that I don't... I, that's not real. <laughs> like, I don't, like, it's this is... It's not realized. I think it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I can, I, I just tell people I can help you to this extent, but I yeah. really, um, I can't buy your um, hospital for you yeah. and stuff. Uh, but, um, and they usually understand when I just tell them the truth, so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good segue into the Obvious Corporation, which I know is a, a very important initiative for you. And it bleeds in with social responsibility. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that, why you're passionate about it, and why you think social responsibility is so important for corporations and businesses. Yeah, well, that's a good, the, the word initiative is a good word. I want to get back to that in a second. The, 
So the Office Corporation is, um, a, like, let's make no mistake, it's a for-profit endeavor. Uh, it's not, like, I have a foundation, and that's nonprofit, but the Obvious Corporation was actually founded first in 2006 when we um, bought uh, when we bought Odeo back from the investors in order to just tinker. And for nine months, Odeo, Twitter, and three other projects lived in this thing called the Obvious Corporation, which was our dream scenario where Evan and I would just make stuff and. No, with, with no accountability to anybody. And if something looked like worth doubling down on, we would double down on it. And if it grew too big for us to be able to pay for it, then we would spin it out as a separate company. And that's exactly what happened with Twitter, except that when we spun it out, we went with it, um, which wasn't the original plan, we, but we went with it. And so now, um, and so that was obvious corporation's first great success. And then five years later, we decided you know, once we had built this deep executive bench at, at Twitter, um, we started getting the itch to do that same thing, that same idea again, because it was, it's just so incredibly fun. Yeah. And so um, we, we relaunched the Obvious Corporation. And this time around, we um, would, same basic idea, but uh, you mentioned initiatives. So what I did was I studied, um, like, the Rocky Mountain Institute and the Clinton Global Initiative and stuff like that to try to figure out how could we as a company uh, work backwards from really big global uh, change that we want to see happen in the world. How could we work backwards from that to, um, to, to create a, uh, a lens through which we viewed our, our opportunities, uh, things we could work on that would ultimately inch towards these big things. Um, with like a long, a view, a long horizon view. So we came up with a set of three initiatives, and we started working on um, a few different projects that uh, he headed humanity in those directions. Um, and at first we were, at first we said we can do anything. We can we can invest money. Money is something we can offer to uh, to people who we can build our own stuff. Uh, and then if, if we can't build it, other people might build it, and we can help them build it, or we can just give money to other people and build stuff that we think. And so we started out doing investments, and then we realized that um, that, would, that, that was so much fun because we could take all these pitch meetings and all these sorts of things, and it's just incredibly fun to be able to hear all these smart people telling us these great ideas and be able to help them. But ultimately, it was really distracting because we wouldn't be able to work on that project as much as we, we wouldn't be able to really control that project. So we decided not to officially do investing. Um, and then we said, okay, well, we'll build our own projects and we'll partner with some companies, uh, which means um, rather than just investing, they'll come and work, they'll work amongst us and, they, and we'll be like their silent co-founder. We'll be like their second or third co-founder and we'll help them develop their product, design their product, market for them, provide them with workspace, provide them with money, introduce them to people, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so we were doing that with one company and one other company. But that's all we can do because we're not that many people and we don't want to um, oversell our services and, and then not be able to live up to it. And so, and then the third thing, the other thing we're doing now is we're we're building our own project. We're our own startup, and we're working on our own thing, and we're increasingly sharpening our focus on that. Yeah. And that currently is a secret project. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and that blends well into, like, you know, the idea, the, the basically the mission statement of Obvious, even though it's not polished, like, you know, Google has this to make the world's information universally accessible. Um, our sort of rough mission statement is to uh, build systems that help people make the world a better place. It's the idea that humanity moves forward with a little help from technology, and that's where we can come in. We can make that technology that helps people work together to make the world a better place. And so um, that's, that's what Obvious does, and we're about uh, a dozen people, half of us engineers, and uh, we're in a little, um, a little spot in San Francisco, and we're, we're just getting started. Great. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Uh, I'd love to hear some of your predictions about where is social media headed? 
Uh, well, I think in a, just in a broader sense, I think we're headed towards like the next phase of the internet. I think um, if you're thinking about things from a high altitude, we've built something amazing over the last 10, 15 years. And uh, what we've built is this incredible, gigantic, ever-growing um, uh, repository of information. And you have companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter saying, I think, credibly, that they are going to connect all 7 billion people on the planet to each other and to all the information available in the world. And I believe them. And so I think, uh, I, I ask myself, OK, if that's true, what's the next, what do, what's innovation look like once that's true? And I think there's a lot of interesting problems that, that come about, uh, such as we, none of us were built to handle a, a world where infinite information is accessible to us. And I also think that more information doesn't mean more knowledge. Information is not knowledge. That was an yep. Einstein quote. Uh, just because you have more, have more stuff doesn't mean you actually are smarter. And just because you um, get more information doesn't mean you're going to act on it. So I think for prediction purposes, and, and I think this has been signaled already, I think the next phase, what, you asked me about social media, but I think it's sort of everything sure. blending together. The next, the next phase, I think, of the internet is, is like the equation of um, I plus U equals A, which is information plus understanding equal, equals action. And it's the idea that, um, that because under, knowledge is really understanding. Once you understand something, once you truly understand something, you are able to take action on it. Um, so the future really is the digital leaping into reality. And some of the, some of the real world examples of that would be something as dramatic as Arab Spring, where I think that um, uh, tools like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter allowed a, a whole bunch of people in a similar predicament to get information and understand, truly understand that there were other people that felt the same way as them, and that if they were to stand up against it, they wouldn't be alone. And, other, and in fact, other people would stand with them. And I don't think you would have had that, um, that group awareness without that sort of technology. And so that understanding allowed them to, uh, and empowered them to uh, take action. And, and real world change was, um, was upon them. Actual, actual oppressive dictators were toppled. I mean, that's, that's a dramatic example. A less dramatic example would be like Do you feel this. personal pride in that when you see those, happen, those things happen and you know that what you um, created was a, a big part of that? Is that, is that something that? It validates you in some it doesn't spiritual way, even? I no, mean, I a... think it validates the humanity and the, the ability. The, I think what it, what it, the statement that it makes is that humanity is really, it's people that are really uh, making change in the world. And it's technology that, um, that's just kind of greasing the wheels for them and helping them out. It just, I mean, it, yeah, it, um, it gives me pride as like a person, you mm -hmm. know? Um, that we can, that we're able to um, feel one another's empathy, understand one another in a global, it makes me feel like a global citizen, sure. which makes me feel like we're headed in the right direction, humanity-wise, and that technology is playing a part in that. So uh, just to go back to the sort of the future of knowledge turning into ac action, less dramatic example is this Fitbit that I wear um, that, help, that helps me, that gives me information on how many calories I'm, I'm taking in and how many steps and calories I'm burning, which gives me the understanding of, uh, it makes me understand how to lose weight. And, and through, through this information, I, I was able to lose like 30 pounds. So I real, something real happened because 
something in the digital space, yeah. some Im information was turning into knowledge. Yeah. And, uh, and so th those are two, obviously, um, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum or wi a wide array. Sure. But I think to answer, the short answer to your question is the next phase is, um, what, do we, how, what does innovation look like on top of a, a globally connected world? And I think that it, it looks like people being able to actually get smarter and, and take action based on the information and knowledge that they're able to get from the internet. I mean, that's the, that was the true promise of the internet in the first place, was that we would be able to um, be all connected, share information, and get smarter. And we haven't been getting smarter. Uh, we, we, the format uh, has, has actually sort of remained the same for the internet and for blogs. I mean, we started making blogs in 1999, and they're, they're the same. They're the main content with the sidebar to get more traffic over here. And, the, and, and web, big websites are, are going for um, uniques and, and um, page views. And, and um, that kind of engagement isn't like, I don't think is the metric, the future metric for success. Future metric for success is uh, what kind of positive impact are we having in the world? Are we getting smarter? Um, are, you know, are better things happening, et cetera? And we'll figure out ways of measuring that kind of stuff. And in the next 10 years, we'll meet again and talk about all the wonderful things we've done um, as, as a group as humanity, uh, we've moved forward that much faster because we've been able to move together as one. Yep. So I have two more questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience, who I'm sure we'll have a, a few questions as well. I, I, I've learned that you have some anecdotes or kind of uh, aphorisms that are important to you that, that kind of either are about life or business or just personal success. Yeah, so. well, I shared a couple already, and that like opportunity can be manufactured. and. Um, uh, and that creativity is a renewable resource. And I actually jotted some stuff down somewhere in here um, before, because I have some new ones too <laughs> that I made up recently for my team. And let me run through these quickly. Um, so I already told you the first two, but I, the second two kind of aphorisms that I've taken to heart um, uh, are, there's this movie called Wings of Desire. It's a German movie from the 1980s, directed by Wim Benders. It was remade with Nick Cage in the 90s. That one's not good. Um, <laughs> Shocker. Yeah. But uh, the original one is really interesting. It's about these two immortal angels who watch over humanity and sort of make sure that everything is kind of going all right. And they can hear everybody and see everybody, but no one can see them. And one of them wants to falls in love with this lonely circus trapeze artist. It's a bit of an art film, if you haven't um, gotten that yet. Um, and uh, he longs to know what it would feel like to like, hold a warm cup of coffee in his hands or um, you know, taste chocolate or, or fall in love and kiss this woman and all these things. So he tells his buddy angel, uh, his buddy immortal angel, like, hey, I'm thinking of, you know, renouncing my immortality and falling to earth as a, as a mortal. And his friend's like, are you crazy? You give up on immortality? That's nuts. And he's like, I want to do it because I want to experience these things. And so he does it, and he falls to earth. And conveniently, his angelic armor is made out of gold, and um, he is able to pawn that to get a suit. I think they just wrote that in so he could get a suit. Um, and, uh, and then you know, he, you know he's, he meets the woman, and he falls in love, and it's great and everything. But he, Ultimately, he's going to die like a regular man. And what I took away from that movie is that, is that with a great aphorism for startups is that to succeed spectacularly, you need to be willing to fail spectacularly. In other words, you need to be willing to die uh, in order to achieve your goals. Now, I don't, I mean, not really die, but. Um, Go out there, commit. Yeah, yeah like to really, and, yeah. and, and so many startups, um, they always try to hedge, you know, like, well, we'll do some consulting on the side. Sure. And so you just have to cut all that off and go all the way and max out all the cards. And like, you're either totally screwed or it'll work. Because I, I, I totally screwed myself like two, two or three times before it worked. And then the other one is, I, meant, I touched on it briefly, but um, when I started working with the product Red People years ago, they, they made me realize something that was just 
wild. Um, they have these, they talk about these two retroviral pills that they can give to HIV uh, patients. If they give them these two pills a day, then uh, over like 30 days or 60 days or something like this, um, something called the Lazarus effect kicks in. And these people look like they're just walking corpses at first. I mean, they look like they're just gonna, I mean, the kids and the adults and everything, they look, they, they look like they're just gonna die. And after about 30 days of taking these two pills every day, they look robust and full of life, and that's why they call it this Lazarus effect. It's like they've come back to life. And now they're, um, they're not, they, they're, they can't spread the disease anymore. It's, it's very likely that they won't spread the disease. They, but the main thing is they can go back to work, and they can go back to school, and they can go back to being a mom, and they can do all these things. And what happens is, um, over time, an entire, there's a geoeconomic impact in that area. And like because of people going back to work and school and all that stuff, and then they move on to another area, and same thing, same thing. And so what you, and so what the lesson, the aphorism from that is that, what I said before is that altruism has this compound interest. Like you start small and you keep doing this stuff and just keep at it, and you have, like that geoeconomic impact is huge because eventually an entire country is like turned on and you can go to the next one, it's big. Um, and then, those are like the, those are stories that have aphorisms from. I don't, I don't have, I don't know if you have time for me to run through my. Give us two, two more, three, and then, four, uh, we'll five, six. I have seven assumptions for doing business that are, and then I have a whole bunch of other things. But I don't want to, I don't want to. I could your... talk forever. <laughs> Here's assumptions. Here's some quick assumptions. Like these are the things that we share with new employees. Okay. The idea being that when you. You're not supposed to make assumptions. You know the old saying, when you yeah. assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Yes. Uh, but the thing is, people make assumptions anyways. So if you're going to make assumptions, please assume this about, um, this is what we created for Twitter. Um, but I think it would work for anybody. Assume that our goal is to change the world, build a business, and love our work. And that's, our, that's what we call success. And if we don't have all three of those things, then we're not successful. Uh, a lot of companies, two is good. But yeah. for us, all three. Assume we don't always know what's going to happen. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, will pretend they know what's going to happen. I think you're kind of screwed if you do that because it's not true. You don't know. Everything. You don't know. Um, assume there's a creative problem, the creative answer to every problem. That goes back to the creativity is renewable resource thing. Uh, a, a big one is a, a big one is assume there are more smart people outside the company than inside. So, like, obvious has 12 people. Don't. Don't assume that we're all the smartest people we know. That's silly. There's go get advice elsewhere. There's way more smarter people in other places. Um, the other thing is, we will win if we do the right thing for our users. That's just kind of a Silicon Valley thing. Yeah. Um, but people forget that. Citibank yeah. forgot that they're a 200-year-old company. Yeah. They forgot that they were in the business of fulfilling the American dream of helping people get homes. They got all involved in this credit default swap business, and they took their eye off the users, and they almost lost a 200-year-old company. Um, so they forgot to just do the right thing for the users, uh, and it almost cost them the whole thing. Um, another big thing is the only deal worth doing is the win-win deal, because. Um, Doing business is like a relationship, and you have to work at it. And if you're getting way more out of a relationship than another person is, that relationship is going to end. It's doomed. Yeah. So when we do business, we, we make sure that we're not like, ha we screwed and we got the better deal. That, that means that it, you're, that relationship is doomed. And then finally, um, and this just speaks to human nature being people are afraid of what they don't know. And, and when, you, when the organization gets bigger and you don't know Phil in marketing, then you think that, and he said, he laid out his plan at some meeting three months ago, and, and then what turned out to be is different than what he said, and then you think Phil's a jackass, and, um, but guess what Phil thinks of your plan, and you, yeah. you know? Um, so we ask people to assume that their coworkers are smart, and that they have good intentions. Just assume that always, and if you don't know someone, go introduce yourself to them and ask how you can help. Great. And so those are like seven assumptions we ask people to, to do before they start work um, awesome. with us. Um, so let's do this. Let's end last question on some word And then I have. <laughs> last question, we'll turn over to the audience. A uh, little word association, a little fun thing here to end with. I'm going to give you the name of a person or a company, and I want you in one word, or it could be a small phrase, a short phrase, to describe what comes to mind. OK. 
Okay. This is like therapy. Like, are you yeah. going to show me some Rorschachs after this? Steve Jobs. I'm sorry to say this, but I think the word that comes to mind is crazy. Okay. Um, even though I, you know, you don't need to everyone admires them. Well, good crazy, though. Yeah. Good crazy. Okay, Google. So the, my phrase, let's say, my, 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 phrase is, my phrase is good crazy for Steve Jobs. Okay. Good crazy. All right, Google. Uh, oddly enough, fun was my, because that's what I had when I was working there. Okay. Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, smart, and then the other word, unfortunately, that comes to mind is robot. <laughs> okay. China. The piece of tape over the mouth comes to mind. Yeah. Twitter. Uh, the opposite. Of, you know, this, the bird in flight, freedom of speech and freedom of expression. And probably the most difficult one, Biz Stone. Uh, uh, I guess um, just silly. <laughs> comes to mind, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for the Thank you. Yeah, this, Thanks that was for awesome. having me. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So we have some audience questions. Hi, um, my name's Adam, and first of all, I think it's, uh, I think it's great that you came down here. Um, it's inspiring, and it's somebody, you obviously don't need to come down here, but you have a lot of insight, and you share that with people, and I think that even making the trip down here is uh, an act of, not courage, but an act of, of inspiration, and I appreciate it, and a lot of us really, really appreciate it. But oh, thank you. My question is, um, if... What would be your advice to somebody that, that uh, has a secret project or has a great idea, how to get started, you know, knowing that being such a great idea, somebody could say, oh, yeah, that's a great idea, and then just take it and do it themselves. And so there's that fear there. Yeah. And my question for you is, if you're in that situation or that scenario, um, what would be the smart steps or what would be the way... You know, I have a lot of people that I've told that, that all agree instantly at everything, but yeah. that doesn't get me anywhere, and an idea doesn't get me anywhere, so no. how do you take it to that next step? Yeah, um, so let me just clarify. When I said we had a secret project, it's, it's secret in, like, the, in that I don't want to announce it at a thing. Right. Um, but but uh, I don't believe in um, keeping a secret. You've got to collaborate. Like, and for, for, an idea to come, for an idea to be executed, you have to tell your secret project to um, lots of people, um, not in a like a, um, like a in a you know when you're on stage somewhere, but like you you <laughs> you you tell your um, you you have to tell smart folks that you want to work with about your idea and, and get their opinion on it, and you have to surround yourself with smarter people than you, and you have to start sharing it with um, the, those people that you believe can help you make it. Um, real and you have to be willing to um, give, the, you know, trust them and, and give them ownership of, of it and, um, and uh, you have to be willing to, uh, the main thing I usually say to, to, to like a startup team is just um, share your idea with people, get the right crew together and start working really hard on your project and that's probably not even, you're probably going to end up throwing that away. Um, because there's going to be something inside your project that's like, oh, that's actually our real thing. And even though that sounds kind of jackassy to say, like to a brand new group, like, okay, so you guys are working really hard and probably this will suck after three months. And, the, and it's like, what? But, um, but that, it's actually a good thing because it means you found your true love, you know? But it's like, uh, so my advice is I, don't keep it a secret or it'll never happen. And, and, and an idea is just an idea. There's probably, there's likely a hundred other people that have had the same idea. It's all about execution. Um, and I, I still think there's lots of things that you could just redo. Like, you know, everyone thought Mark Zuckerberg was a little weird when he started a social network after there was already like all these social networks. People were like, why are you starting a social network? There's already like Friendster and all these other things. Like, it seems a little late in the game. And now it's huge, you know? And same thing with, like, WordPress. Matt Mullenweg started a blogging platform after there was already Blogger and, 
and um, t uh, type, movable type, and all this other stuff, and everyone thought it was silly, and it was huge. So um, just uh, you know, be willing to fail spectacularly, I think, is the key. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Stone, uh, thank you so much for your insights. My name is Philip Corwin. I'm uh, counsel to the Internet Commerce Association, which is the trade group for the domain investment uh, industry. And in that role, and, and with many other clients, I'm used to representing people with very disruptive technologies that, that challenge the existing political and economic order. So I'm asking this from that perspective and not to be critical, but to get that you you were talking about, that understanding. Uh, last week, your company had probably its first controversy over a corporate policy when you announced that in order to be able to offer Twitter in certain countries, you would have to take some steps to restrict what would be discussed in Twitter uh, feeds. Uh, and that immediately brought some negative reaction from your users so that you were implementing a censorship regime. I wonder if you could explain to all of us why the company felt it had to take that step, how it will actually be implemented, because what's sensitive in one country is perfectly acceptable in another and vice versa. And maybe most important, how do you feel about having to make this type of compromise to get the tool out there to people around the world? This is a great question. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the way that... <laughs> They should have asked me to write that blog post for them. Um, Twitter basically wrote the wrong blog post. Here, here's, the, here's the truth. There are wacky laws all around the world. Um, and some of them are just really silly. And some of them are like you know borderline. For example, in France and Germany, uh, it is illegal. It's against the law to um, publish any sort of pro-Nazi material. Uh, in Asia, there's identity type stuff, and in the UK, there's libel type stuff. But uh, in France and Germany, for example, you, it is against the law to publish pro-Nazi uh, material, and uh, that's always been true. And when and we've we've been in Twitter's been in Germany and France since like we started. Basically, people have been accessing it and using it, and we have very clear. Uh, rules on Twitter uh, that we've been following since day one about a, a very narrow uh, beam of the type of content that we would remove from the system. One, spam. Two, illegal. Uh, and three, uh, specific threats of violence. So you, you can say, I hate my teacher, I want to kill him, but you can't say, I'm going to kill Susan such and such at 3 PM with a knife at this place. Um, and so we actually have always followed these rules. When, when, when a local government from another country jumps through the right hoops, um, the right legal hoops that we have in place to, to issue takedown order for content that is illegal, we have always done this. Unfortunately, we've had to do it with a very blunt instrument. So if someone posts pro-Nazi propaganda in France, we had, we've had to take it down globally. So what they announced last week was a new technology that actually allows us to, uh, to have less censorship by only taking down that content in France and Germany and leaving it up everywhere else. So that is a, a huge win for freedom of speech. Uh, you could argue whether or not leaving up pro-Nazi stuff is good or not, but that, that's, not the, that's not the point. The point is we're only, now we're able to only take it down there as, as opposed to globally, which is what we had to do before. And not only that, we're, we're, we're taking it down only in those countries and putting up a notice that says this was taken down because of this silly law. And so we're actually introducing a new form of transparency in addition to creating less uh, less censorship. So what, what the problem was is that um, the folks who wrote the blog post at Twitter wrote it as if the general populace follows Twitter's policies and strict uh, commitment to freedom of speech. And nobody cares. Nobody watches our policies. And, um, and also that they, that they read our blog regularly and that they've read our posts about how um, how committed we are to leaving content up no matter what. Um, basically, what this was was a huge win 
um, for freedom of speech. And uh, I think yesterday, um, Google just copied our, um, just did the exact same thing. And I'm like, yeah, we're, oh, we're doing that too. We do that too for a blogger now. Um, so that's, uh, that's my answer on that. We, um, it's just a huge win for us. And some people said, oh, what it was read as is now you're censoring, whereas we had always removed content for those specific legal reasons, but now we're able to remove much less of it. Also, people said, is, does this mean you're getting ready to go to China? No. Um, basically, China is the opposite of Twitter. I mean, they, they don't, they're antithetical to our entire belief system. So I don't see us being able to do business in China anytime soon, even though people use Twitter in China because they find ways to do it. Thank you for inc uh, increasing our understanding on that. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Joe Nuccio. Yeah. Um, Thanks for the uh, chat. Earlier you, mentioned, earlier you mentioned there were three signs when you knew it was time to sell your business. Um, I'm wondering if you might share those. Oh, yeah. There's th sort of three reasons, I think, that a, an entrepreneur would want to sell their business. Um, one, and, and in no particular order, one might just be um, personal. You're sick of working on that job and you don't want to do it anymore or you know family reasons or like something's happened in the family and you just want out. You're just done and you want out so you sell your company. That's like a personal thing. Uh, another reason might be your whole company is about to be crushed and destroyed and eliminated and removed from the world. Um, I think a good example of that is YouTube. They were about to be sued into oblivion and um, so they sold to Google and Google absorbed all the legal fees and so forth. So if you're about to just be absolutely you know, choked out, um, now would probably be a good time to sell if you're being offered a lot of money. <laughs> um, and the third, the third reason is a, sort of a mix of personal and, um, and money and in that if the acquiring company is offering you a number that far exceeds the number that you see in your wildest dreams as the potential number your company could ever be worth. Uh, so if you think your company could be one day be worth $250 million and a company offers you a billion dollars, uh, you should probably uh, take it. Um, <laughs> like, you know, if you're building an iPhone app that helps you find, that's based off of Facebook and helps you find friends nearby and you think, well, we might be a $100 million company and, and then Facebook offers you $500 million, I, you should take the money, you know? Um, those are the three reasons. I think, and I think if you run through your head, is it one of these things, then you know you want to, and it's not, then you just keep working on your company. Thank you. Hello, uh, John Yeomans with Winter Names. Just out of curiosity, how or what were the hows or whys or rhyme or reason of arriving at 140 character max for tweets? Well, we, like I said earlier, we, we were inspired by this text messaging platform. It was, a, it, it was global in nature. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a cool platform that wasn't being developed for anything particularly innovative. And the global standard limit for all text messages uh, is 160 characters, um, and what we what we did was we we decided we wanted to leave room for the author. We wanted tweets to be both readable and writable entirely within that limit, um, so so that they would work on the lowest common denominator device, such as a um, feature phone, a, like a flip phone or something that can only do SMS. So. Uh, what we did was we, we reserved space for the author's name in front and then standardized on 140, um, which is funny because we only leave 15 characters for the name and we're actually wasting five. At one point I suggested an ad model that just five character ads. Um, <laughs> you just have to be really creative. <laughs> Uh, but that's how we got to 140, because we thought it would be fair to standardize and give everyone the same amount. Thank you. 
think we have time for maybe one more question here. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Paige Howe from Domain University. I want to ask you about being kind of new and hip and trendy and growing and edgy like a fashion brand and then someone saying, hey, the Pope has a Twitter account and some brands in the fashion world might say, boy, that's the end of it. You know what I mean? Now we're too mainstream. And then, of course, you guys have gone from this really not needed thing, which was a big part of the appeal, to now needing to be or, you know, wanting to be more pervasive. And how do you kind of balance, you know, those, those two things from being, from being both or wanting to have both worlds, I guess? Well, I think um, when you're no longer hip and cool, that's good. Um, like, that means that you're on your way towards becoming a, uh, a part of the way people live their lives. So, like, we, I mean, we never thought we were hip and cool because we, I mean, the first people on Twitter were just nerds, just a bunch of, like, nerds. And so it, di it wasn't like it was cool. It was super dor dorky and nerdy and stuff. Um, but in that, I guess, in... Maybe like, that's the new cool. Yeah, I mean, I guess that in, our, in that way, that was, that was good, cool. But, um, but, but we always said, like, as soon as we're considered, uh, like, no longer cool, that's great. Because, like, look at the, look at the massively successful things that aren't cool. Um, like, people don't think electricity is, like, hip. Uh, but um, it's awesome, and everyone uses it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you. I think uh, that's all the questions. I, I really do want to thank you for the time. You really uh, do? Yeah, I really do. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, and, I'm, it, was uh, a, it, was, it was a lot of fun, and thank uh, you. you were very candid and honest. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking Biz one more thank time. You. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. You're going to get a standing, I believe. I'm going to stand enough. All right. <laughs> yeah. No one's going to bring me flowers? Yeah, I know. Exactly. They're going to throw it at your feet.